Wall Street Unplugged looks beyond the regular headlines heard on mainstream financial media to bring you unscripted interviews and breaking commentary direct from Wall Street right to you on Main Street. How's it going out there? It's March 13th. And I'm Frank Gersey, host of the Wall Street Unplugged podcast, where I break down the headlines and tell you what's really moving these markets. So I want to start off with a quick note here. Do you know we just raised some money through our security token offering, and we're not done. I want to get to that $12 million mark at one specific meeting. Just hoping to get in to see these guys. A couple of friends working with me to help out with that introduction. Just say you know these people well <laughs> and their firm. Anyway, I don't want to break down the details of a Curzio Equio owner's token again. I mean, I know you guys know about it. And is this the first episode you ever listened to? Then stay tuned because I'm going to break down my favorite stock ideas in Spanish. I'm just kidding. I don't speak Spanish. But seriously, if you're a first time listener, you want to learn more about a Curzio Equity Owners Security Token, you can find everything you need at www.curzioequityowners.com. Now, for the quick note, just to raise money, we are now hiring. And one of our biggest positions is marketing director. Looking for someone with experience in the financial newsletter industry, at least that's preferred. And this is going to be a position of a lifetime if you execute. You're going to make a solid base. I may be open to giving you a potential equity stake in my business, and you're going to receive a percentage of sales. Now, to put this last part in perspective, we're looking to aggressively add names to our list, get our brand in front of millions and millions of newsletter readers. That's why I raise this money, right? We want to expand our brand, get it out there, let everybody know who we are. So getting in now pretty close to the ground floor. And if you believe, which we do, that we could become one of the leaders in this space, the money you're going to generate from the percentage of sales and equity stake alone, forget about the salary, is probably going to be more than what 25% of the CEOs in a Fortune 500 make. I'm not kidding. I've been telling you this. A lot of people don't know this, unless you're an industry insider, you worked in the financial newsletter industry before. But the financial newsletter publishing industry, one of the most scalable, high-margin businesses in the world. And again, if you work size industry, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody I hired told them the same thing, all the numbers, said this is the potential of this industry. And so far, we followed through on everything we said since we started this business. So if you're interested in meeting with me, my team, everybody, just want you to do me a favor. Bring it. No BS. But to hire someone with a chip on their shoulder, someone who's pissed off because maybe your work's not being recognized by your peers. You want to show everyone why you're a superstar in this industry. Maybe you were passed over from someone, someone with less experience. We say that happened all the time. Because for me, I love hiring pissed off people. And I don't mean to curse there. But I have to say, most women that I hire are pissed off. Not pissed off all the time, but pissed off because they haven't received the same pay as men since the dawn of time. And now my company, if I had to guess, wow, yeah, think about this for a second. Easily more than 60% of my employees right now are women. Publisher, two, two managerial positions, just incredible workers, chip on the shoulder, love it. You know, I never looked at it as, hey, I'm hiring women or I'm hiring, you know, it's just... Uh, Women, man, black, white, their religious background. For me, I just always hired the best person for the position. I mean, people who are hungry, devoted, passionate. I mean, that's the way I've always operated. It's the only way, I, you know, my business is two years old. It's the only way I felt, you know, having that drive, having that passion. But if you're interested, email me personally, frankcurziaresearch.com. That's frank at curziaresearch.com. All emails are confidential. And we're also hiring writers and in about a month or two from now, junior analysts. So... A lot of people sent me their resumes about 18 months ago for a junior analyst position. You know, I said, I ah, don't send the resume. Just send me like a little bit of a letter, a detailed letter. You know, resumes, what, are going to say everything perfect? You're great. You're awesome. I did this. I work well with people. Again, I just want to talk to you if you're really interested. And that's what's important to me. So 18 months ago, a lot of people, a lot of people, now we're to feel down and we wind up hiring one person. I was surprised at how many people responded, which is great. I have to tell you, that one person I hired, I already raised his salary by more than 50%. He deserves every penny. 
So I have to kick them out of my office like 11 o'clock at night and weekends. Yes, that's how hard you need to work. And yes, that's how hard I work. <laughs> but he's an incredible worker. And after 18 months of pure dedication, working side by side with me, he's probably, if I had a guess, smarter than 75% of the analysts in this industry already. And look, if you're about to reach out to me and say, wow, this is a great opportunity, I'd like to be a junior analyst, work side by side with you. I'm telling you, listen, it's not, not going to be easy. I'm not going to be easy on you. I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I'm be very honest. I will teach you everything I know. The only thing I ask is the same thing I said before. Just bring it. Because I can teach you everything about fundamentals. The balance sheet, income statements, the strategies I use, everything. But what I realized throughout my career is you can't teach desire, right? You can't teach determination, hard work ethic. Even in sports, it's either you got it or you don't. And Andrew Wiggins is one of the most talented players you will ever see. He played for Kansas. I know him well. He plays for Minnesota, and he doesn't have heart. That's why everybody who plays him wants to leave. Jumps to the moon, great shot, long, great defense. He doesn't have heart. He doesn't have it. That's fine. If you don't have it, please don't email me. That's what I want. Because you work your ass off, it's a great opportunity to one day write your own newsletter under this company. It's not just a position that I'm going to keep you at forever and say, hey, here you go. Just stay there. That's fine. Just keep. No. It's a position that you can move up incredibly if you put the work in. You're going to have access to everything, every industry, every stock we cover, which is a lot. All of my platforms that we use for research, my network, I'm going to be able to go to conferences around the world. So if you're writers, junior analysts, if you're interested in work for Curzio Research, just send me an email, frank at curzioresearch.com. That's frank at curzioresearch.com. Now, let's move on. I'm going to get a little personal with you. And bear with the story because it does have to do with investing. So this girl I know was in pain for the past few weeks. So her pelvis was sore. She had terrible cramps. But she just chalked it up to maybe a pulled muscle. She ran around with kids every day. And the pain started to worsen. So when that happened, she decided to see her doctor. Took it a little bit more serious. And after several tests, the doctor knows some excess swelling in her endometrium. Okay, the endometrium is that's a layer of cells that form the lining in your uterus. So pelvis pain, swelling, vaginal bleeding, between menstrual cycles are, are symptoms of you know, this form of cancer, right? It's called endometrial cancer. And although it's not a common form of cancer, if caught early enough, removing the uterus often cures it. Again, got to catch it early enough. So the doctor ordered this person to get a biopsy with a specialist right away. And the quickest appointment she can get was in early April. And she first saw this doctor two weeks ago. She said, okay, that, that's the earliest. I need to lock in this date right away with the specialist, right? So a biopsy is going to be an in-office procedure. So in other words, you don't have to go to a hospital. You know, surgery is done in office. And, you know, that usually reduces your costs considerably than going to the hospital. But here's where things get interesting. This person decided to call her health insurance provider to get more details about surgery. So she's covered under her husband's plan. It's a good plan, but it includes an annual deductible, which so many plans include these days. If you're not familiar with deductibles, take auto insurance, whatever. Deductibles are simply how much you need to spend out of pocket before your insurance kicks in. It's the greatest thing for insurance companies. You try to avoid as much as you can. And also, you know, stops people from going to the hospital when they just you know, have the sniffles and stuff like that because you actually have to pay for it out of pocket. To her surprise, her insurance provider said they do not cover in-house surgeries. They told her, hey, you know what? You got to go to the hospital to get the procedure done. But since it's an important procedure, she discussed those options with her husband. At the careful research, they found a total cost for doing the surgery in office, which is important because in office gives her a closer date compared to doing it at the hospital, pushed out even further to go see the specialist. So getting it done in office, which means the health insurance is not going to cover anything, was $2,300. But when this person priced the surgery at the hospital, the administration office told her it would cost $13,000 at the hospital compared to $2,300 in-house. More than five times the amount for the same surgery. Grants in the hospital, maybe a couple more doctors. I get it. Five times the amount. But her deductible is $1,500. And that's a deductible you have to pay regardless. An insurance company said that it's $13,000, but they're going to charge it 20% for this specific procedure. So basically, the woman has two options. 
She could pay $2,300 out of pocket to have the in-office surgery, which is very important, this biopsy. Or she could pay over $4,000 out of pocket to have it at the hospital, which includes a $1,500 deductible and 20% of the $13,000 in costs. So insurance is really doing nothing, right? But the choice is obvious. It's going to be much cheaper for my wife to get the procedure done in office. Yes, I'm talking about my wife. So she knows the doctor's got to perform the surgery, which is good. Plus, the office is a few miles away from the house. It's much closer than driving all the way to Jacksonville, 45 minutes away, to get the procedure done at some crazy crowded hospital. But we should know the results within a few weeks. And my wife, as you guys know, I share all the personal stories with me because you guys have family. I love you. She's a breast cancer survivor, so she's a fighter. She's much stronger than I'll ever be. So all I ask is that, you know, you keep her in your prayers over the next couple of weeks and we get some good news on this. Now, I chose to tell you this personal story to highlight one of the biggest issues facing us as a nation. And that's how effed up our healthcare system has become. Because my wife needs a biopsy right away. She had cancer in the past, should be priority, yet she has to wait a little bit over a month to get her next appointment. Our insurance coverage for our company, my company, which is one of the best within the industry, believe it or not, is doing everything in their power to not provide coverage for us. And this is amazing, considering boatloads of cash I shell out every single month to make sure my full-time employees have health insurance. This isn't an isolated problem. This isn't me ranting about a specific thing, okay? Which, you know, I often do, and it's great, and I rant, and I get, I get you know, usually great feedback. Now, health insurance companies are finding more and more ways to pass on rising costs to us. This includes significantly raising premiums every year, raising the price of deductibles while covering fewer procedures. Now, I'm going to have one of the most amazing educational segments since I've been taping this podcast for over 10 years. I'm not exaggerating. Where well, you're going to hear numbers that are going to scare the crap out of you. We all know healthcare costs are killing our nation. We hear it all the time, but we, it's put in the same context as education. Right, the amount of vast amount of debt in auto loans, talking two trillion dollar markets, keep going higher and higher. And everybody's like, "Oh, it's going to be fine." And you know, we know the healthcare costs. We got to change it. It's a lot worse than you'll ever imagine. In fact, I place this as the biggest investment risk that could actually push us into a deep recession and cause a forty percent plus drop in the stock market. I'm not talking about the 40% drop, guys, that you hear from perma bears who've been dick you know, every single day for 10 years. Right? And when they're right, they're going to be like, I told you so. Even though the market went up, the biggest bull market in the history, right? in the generation at least. No, I've never said things like that before, that the market could crash 40%. But after digging through the numbers and what I'm about to share with you, it's going to be very difficult for you to disagree because there is no end in sight. There's no solution in sight. I'm going to show you guys how to prepare for it. I'm going to give you investment ideas from it. And why, if we do not change this, though, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. I do that in just a minute, my educational segment. But first, but first, I have an amazing interview for you. It's a little different than the traditional analysts and stock pickers that I have on here. So please let me know what you think after you hear it. But his name is Chester Santos. And he's known as the International Man of Memory. Some of the biggest institutions in the world hired this guy to speak to their employees, places like Harvard, Morgan Stanley, NASDAQ, Credit Suisse, I can go on and on. He's been featured everywhere. 2020 ABC, NBC, Business Week, CBS, Wall Street Journal, Fox. So Chester basically teaches memory skills to individuals. And he's the right guy for the job, considering he's a champion, a memory champion. They actually have a contest on this. The guy that recall every Kentucky Derby winner since the results started in 1875, getting over 200 members of any audience after just basically asking their name once and seeing them for 10 seconds, he'll remember all 200 or more of their names. He's done this time and time again for almost every audience that he speaks in front of. Recite every member of the U.S. Congress. But in this interview, he's even going to test me to prove how great his system works. It's just one thing. Chester travels all the world, speak conferences and companies. It's an amazing interview. We will put this one together for you. He was on the road when we did this interview, and despite using a landline, Skype, mobile, the sound quality was not that great. So you're going to hear the entire interview, just preparing you, because Chester is amazing, and I'd rather you get an interview with eh, not too great sound, because we did listen to this, and it's good. You're going to like it, but eh, you're going to notice that it is a little fuzzy. But after listening to it, I thought it was great to put it out there for you. 
You can learn everything about him. Even if you want to sign up to his services, again, I don't get paid for anything. I don't get paid from anyone that comes onto my podcast here. It's just something I think that can help us incredibly. And it's already helping me. It really is. So I watched his videos. I did everything. It was fantastic. And I just think even in the stock market, you notice that the biggest companies within our industry use this guy to help out their employees. Give it a listen. Again, it's a different type, type of interview. Let me know what you think. You might hate and say, stick to stock, Piggy Frank. It's great. But I think this will be very, very beneficial to most of the listeners out there. But again, this podcast is about you, not about me. Let me know what you think, as always. Now, enough of the buildup here. Here's my interview with Chester Santos. Chester Santos, thanks so much for joining us on Wall Street Unplugged. Thank you so much for having me, Frank. I'm looking forward to the interview. So now I'm pretty sure I would say most of my audience heard of you, right? Maybe they saw you on TV, which is NBC, 2020, Business Week, CBS, CNN. I had to write all these down, ABC, Wall Street Journal, Fox. I can keep going. You've also been asked to speak at, at UC Berkeley, Harvard, Stanford, Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse, NASDAQ. Numerous institutions hire you to speak to their employees. And you also gave a pretty amazing TED Talk, which I watched recently, which is fantastic. But for people who maybe don't know you, you call yourself a memory expert. Explain this concept, and maybe if you could explain how you know you were able to make an incredible, successful career from this. Uh, yeah, Frank. Thanks for for looking me up and and the <laughs> various things that I that I've done over the years. I have been uh, on a lot of different TV shows, asked to perform memory feats. But there's really nothing different about my brain compared to everyone else's. I've just learned some techniques that really anyone can learn that are very powerful and effective. And I've put in a little bit of training and practice. In addition to being asked to be on TV shows, I have been a speaker for many different types of organizations over the years because an improved ability to remember can really benefit you in just about any career. And also, it would be useful in anyone's personal life. So I really help people from a wide range of backgrounds to improve their ability to remember names and faces, to get more out of business networking, presentations, important facts and figures to better demonstrate your expertise. Memory really is fundamental to learning, so it's going to have a positive impact on multiple areas of your career and on your personal life. Yeah, and it makes a lot of sense because you know, this is an investment podcast, but when you have people and companies, Morgan Stanley Credit Suisse, NASDAQ, there's a reason why. And you know, I think you, you hit the nail on the head where uh, it, it pertains to anyone, anywhere, any industry, anything that you do. And let's get right into it here because you said something interesting that your brain's not different from anyone else's. It's just a matter of training it. How do you do it? I mean, is there techniques? That, what are some of the things that people I – and mean, let's get started. Let's go right into it right here. Is some of the techniques that people could use, some of the things that you explain uh, to help people uh, you know, just have a much better memory? Yes. Yeah, so there are three main principles that memory champions like my would put into practice. One, visualization. Take whatever it is that you are trying to remember and in some way turn it into a visual, something that you can picture in your mind. Uh, we're very good at remembering things things that we see. An example that I like to give in my presentations around the world is the situation that we've all experienced at some point in our life where we will see someone that we could have met. We could have met that person years ago, years in the past. Oftentimes, right away, as soon as we see their face, we remember their face. We know that we've met them somewhere before. We can't seem to remember the name, right? Another example, how many times have you been to a party with one of your friends Two weeks after the party is over, your friend is describing someone to you that you met at the party. Your friend says, remember that attorney that we met a couple of weeks ago at that party? He's also a member of the tennis club. As your friend's going through that description, you can picture the person from the party. You might even remember what he was wearing the night when you met him, but a lot of times you can't remember the name, right? A, a third and final example, how many times have you been describing to a friend and then family member, an actor from a TV show or movie, as you're going through this description, crystal clear in your mind, you can picture the actor, your friend or family member can also picture who you're describing, but neither one of you can manage to remember the name. Those three examples that I just went 
over all illustrate that it, when, when it comes to our interactions with people, we tend to be really good at remembering faces. We can pull up the face in our mind, but we're not nearly as good at remembering names. When you think about it, this makes sense because when you're interacting with people, you actually see their face, right? The face is recorded into your visual memory, but at no point do you see the name. The name is something much more abstract to the brain. So one thing I teach for names is to turn the names into powerful visuals. Mike might be a microphone that you would visualize. Jane, maybe you see a chain. For the name Alice, sometimes I would visualize a white rabbit because that might remind you of Alice in Wonderland. So visuals is one important principle. From there, also try to involve additional senses as you can. As you involve more senses when you are trying to encode information into your memory, you're activating more areas of your brain and you're building more connections in your mind to the information. Third and final idea principle to keep in mind is to make all of this that you are seeing and experiencing, make it crazy, unusual, extraordinary in some way, because there is a psychological aspect to human memory. Frank, if in the studio right now uh, that you're in, if an elephant suddenly crashed into the studio right now and started spraying water all over you with its trunk, if that actually happened right now, you might remember that for the rest of your life and always tell that story without you even trying to commit that to memory, right? There is this psychological aspect to memory that uh, in which we remember things with little to no effort. We automatically remember things that are crazy, unusual, extraordinary in some way. When you can put all of that together, visuals, other senses, make it all crazy, unusual, extraordinary, when you can start to put that all together, it will suddenly become incredibly easy, really, to remember just about anything at all. Chester, you mentioned that example with the elephant, and I was watching your TED Talks, which you did amazing. Right? It was, I think it was from like 2014 or 15, if I remember, where you're just going through every single member of the audience. You knew almost everyone in the audience. You remember their name just by knowing them once. And I actually took this test because I love doing a lot of research on my guests, my interviews. I take this very seriously. And... I actually took the test where you said, I'm going to give you guys a bunch of random words. And it was about 15, maybe. And when you first said them, I'm like, you're crazy. <laughs> I was like, this, I lost you after the third one. And then you taught through the TED Talks. You said, this is how you remember it. Create visuals. Create this whole story in your head. I still, I still remember that. And this was two days ago. I remember every single word. Could you explain that concept? Because I think if people really see that, especially when I saw it, someone that's like, there's no way I'll remember this. And I literally remember every one of those random words a few days later. I wonder if you could do something like that here, explain how that actually worked in real, in real time, all those principles that you just explained. Yes, uh, totally, Frank. Let's do that. And your listeners can follow along. So we'll go through the same exercise that I did on my TED Talk and people listening this can follow along. So what I did at the beginning, towards the beginning of the talk, after, after I named about 110 people in the audience, I went into applying those three main principles, visualization, additional senses from there, and then also using your creativity and imagination to make it all crazy, unusual, extraordinary. We put that into practice using something called the story method. So I rattled off to the audience the following random list of words. It was monkey, iron, rope, kite, house, paper, shoe, worm, envelope, pencil, river, rock, tree, cheese. And then nowadays I changed the last word from then. Now the last word is dollar. Um, a lot of times when I recite that list of words, to audiences, people are looking at me at that TED Talk, people are looking at me as if, you know, I was crazy or something. They <laughs> think it would be impossible to remember all of those words unless I give them, you know, a really long time to do it. And the TED Talk is supposed to be like 12 or so minutes, 15 minutes max total. But really, everybody can commit that to memory perfectly forwards and backwards with just about three minutes. That's it of study time, and even one or two weeks from now, they would still know all of the words forwards and backwards. They're just going to keep those principles in mind that I talked about in the beginning of the interview, 
So the first word was monkey. I just want everyone listening listening to this. Visualize a monkey. Just see this monkey in your mind. Imagine that this monkey is dancing around, making monkey noises. Whatever monkey would sound like, I'm still working on the monkey impression. The point here is to see and hear that monkey, right? Just have fun with it. The monkey now picks up a gigantic iron because that was the next word. So everyone just see this monkey dancing around with a giant iron. The iron starts to fall, but a rope attaches itself to the iron. Maybe even feel the rope. It feels sort of rough. Interact with it. You look up the rope you see that the other end of the rope is attached to a kite. That kite is flying around in the air. Maybe you even reach up and try and touch it, that kite. The kite now crashes into the side of a house. Really see it crash into that house. The house, you notice, is completely covered in paper. For some strange reason, it's covered in paper. Paper was the next word. Out of nowhere, a shoe appears, and it starts to walk all over the paper. Maybe it's messing up the paper as it's walking on it. That shoe, the shoe smells pretty badly, so you decide to investigate and see why. You look inside the shoe and you find a little worm crawling around inside that shoe. You really see a smelly worm. That worm jumps out of the shoe and into an envelope. Maybe it's going to mail itself or something. I don't know. Envelope was the next word. Out of nowhere, a pencil appears and it starts to write all over the envelope, right? Pencil was the next word. Pencil, now the pencil jumps into a river and there's a huge splash. For some reason, when that little pencil hits the river, the river, you notice, is crashing up against a giant rock, right? Crashing up against a giant rock. That rock flies out of the river and it crashes into a tree, right? Really see it crashing into the tree. This tree is growing cheese you probably haven't seen a tree like that one this one growing cheese and out of each piece of cheese shoots a dollar the last word was dollar now i'm sure most people listening already know all the words but i'm going to go through this again very quickly mm-hmm. and your job if you're listening to this is to just replay through the story in your mind all right so we have the monkey just ask yourself what was it dancing around with an iron what then attached? It was a rope. The other end of the rope was attached to what? It was a kite. What did the kite crash into? A house. What was the house covered in? Paper. What walked on it? A shoe. What was crawling in the shoe? A worm. That worm jumped into what? An envelope. What wrote on it? A pencil. The pencil jumped into the river. What was the river crashing into? A rock. That rock flew into the tree. What was the tree growing? Cheese. And what shot out a dollar? So now everybody listening to this should be able to very easily recall the entire random list of words by simply playing through the story in your mind and recalling each major object that you encounter. So, Frank, why don't you go ahead and try to recite those and people can follow along as they're listening. And see yeah. if they can do it as well. And none of this is written down, so if I make a mistake, I make a mistake. But I've done this procedure uh, to, to uh, listen to it again. But let's so it's monkey. I was thinking, you know, my father I had a stock bank contest against a monkey. The monkey was holding an iron. The iron was attached to a rope. The rope was flying. It was a kite. The kite flew into the building, which happened to be made of paper. Uh, the paper. Let me. See. And then the a shoe came on, stepped on the building. It's a paper building. Then the worm, there's a worm in the shoe, which is a smelly worm who jumped out into an envelope. On the envelope, someone wrote on it with, with a pencil. Uh, the pencil then fell into water, a river. Uh, the river, yep. uh, there was a huge rock in the river, right? And then the rock actually uh, flew into a tree. That's how I, I pictured it. Uh, yeah. The tree was growing cheese for some reason. And then there was dollars coming out of the cheese. Did I get it right? Yeah, last word was dollar. Yeah. Great job. What did the kite crash into, Frank? A build, oh, building. It was a paper build. So it was building house. paper. That's what right. It was house. So that's the only word. Uh, house. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. So, so that was that... only. So you got fourteen out of fifteen, right? Yeah, you were just saying building instead of house, but you got all of the 
uh, visual there is 14 out of 15 of the words correct. So really nice job. So that technique, that, that's just one of many techniques that memory champions like myself use and that what I would teach in, you know, I even do like full day corporate training workshops. That would be one of many techniques we cover. It's called the story method. Uh, then we did it with random words. This could be applied to giving even a speech or presentation, though. Let's say you're going to give a talk to an audience about healthcare in the United States. Maybe your first image is a stethoscope that the doctor uses to check your heartbeat. The first thing you're going to hit on in your presentation is the high cost of healthcare in the United States. Maybe shooting out of the stethoscope are a bunch of $100 bills. Uh, next thing you want to hit on in your presentation is in order to get certain things covered these days, we have to find a way to cut through a lot of red tape. Maybe wrapping itself around the $100 bills is a bunch of red tape. So you'll see even using the simple concept of building a story, you could give a speech or presentation minimizing the amount of notes that you would use. One last example Frank, let's give it a try. You have not gone through this, but we'll illustrate something related to uh, the financial services industry. I want for you to visualize, Frank, a bunch of giant machines. This one will take one of those giant machines. Everybody can follow along that's listening. These giant machines start to smash up a huge pile of gold and silver. All right, a huge pile of gold and silver rising up out of the gold and silver vehicles, whatever that looks like to you, vehicles, shooting out of the windows of the vehicles, medicine, and exploding out of the medicine, oil. Oil explodes out of the medicine. That was it. I'm going to review this again and play through the story in mind. We have giant machines. We're smashing up what? Gold and silver. What rose up? Vehicles. What shot out of the windows of the vehicles? It was medicine. And what exploded out of the medicine, it was oil. Try to cite those to me, Frank, and people listening can follow along and see if they can do it. Okay, so you have, you started off with these machines. I'm thinking wash machines with gold and silver in them. And then uh, the gold and silver is in a car, which is a vehicle. Uh, the mm -hmm. vehicles have medicine in the glove compartment. And mm -hmm. the medicine, uh, uh oh, I think I might have forgot the very last one already. So, but I am doing this on Something. a fly, so you know, not lie. But uh, the last one yeah. I didn't get. So the last one was what, what's exploding out of the medicine? Exploding out of the medicine was, uh, oh man, it's I think oil. I need help with this. Oil, 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 oil. How did I even get oil wrong since it's in our industry? Oil, oil was. So as you train, yeah. it, you, you, it's just going through every single – because for me, doing this just now, the reason why I got the last one wrong is because I tried to, to really focus on the visuals so much as you were talking about it that I actually didn't get to the last visual with the oil. So that was the problem why I missed it. But it's amazing how when you really think of it and you put a, almost like a, your own story behind it of how – and again, that monkey and, 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 and iron and rope, you know, that's something I learned three days ago to still remember it. it, it it's – Maybe if you can go over and explain, how is your brain, is it training your brain a, a different way? I mean, I know you, you talk about this as, as well, where, okay, fine, you got have the techniques and everything, but what actually is is making your brain remember? Is it just you, you're creating the story behind it? How come I can't do this with, you know, traditional things that it's almost like selective hearing, right? So if my wife is telling me, hey, you know, you need to do this, 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 this over the next two weeks, those are the things I kind of forget, but whenever I have meetings, schedules, and stuff like that, I'm very sharp and I remember it. Is that is it just training your brain a certain way, different areas of the brain? Yeah, so we are very good at remembering what we focus and pay attention to, right? So uh, focus and paying attention, obviously, is fundamental to learning and memory. The great thing about these sorts of techniques is it makes it much more interesting and easier to commit things to memory. So things that we might not want to necessarily focus on and pay attention to, maybe in certain cases we see it as too much work here, uh, it makes it all much easier and it allows you to do that. Again, without realizing it, what we were doing there, using that story method, we were visualizing, right? If you have any blink, like on the oil, you want to involve more senses, so maybe you smell the oil. Maybe you touch mm. the oil and it's really hot. Okay, maybe it's the, the, 
the oil starts to turn from black to purple, so you make it crazy unusual to take advantage of the long thing aspect to memory. This is a skill that you will develop with two minutes practice. You will get better and better at doing it, right? Also, keep in mind when you are learning the technique initially using my images, it will be more difficult for you. But once you develop, started to develop the skill and you're using your own images, all of this will, will be even easier for you to remember because that imagery makes sense to you. So there was actually a point where I had you visualize those images because you just memorize and your listeners memorize without realizing it probably the top five exports of the UK. All right. So if you were to look up right now, the top five exports of the UK, you're going to find listed. The exports are machinery. Okay. Precious metals, vehicles, pharmaceuticals, and oil. So there you start to see how the images, it doesn't just need to be a monkey for a monkey, right? And I am what I am. That imagery can serve as a mental note card or mental cue card. So you just memorize the top five exports of the UK. Now, this might not seem like a lot at first, but when you are meeting with clients, potential clients, or this is a presentation in front of colleagues, when you have these 5, 10, 15 key things committed to memory, you are perceived to be much more of an expert in your particular field. People say, wow, you know, uh, Frank really knows his stuff. He's got all of this down. He's clearly an expert. Also, the bottom line is whether or not it is truly the case doesn't actually matter. The perception is when we meet with someone, right, our, and our perception is that they seem to know everything, we also perceive them to be intelligent. We're always going to go out of our way to do business with those people that we perceive to be the most intelligent and the most of an expert in their particular field. And just a little bit of memory training can really help you with this. So this is a little bit goes a long way. This is really huge. This will make you more memorable other people. No, that's great. So, and, and you know what? I, I want to get to the point because you, you mentioned it earlier, and I don't think I mentioned it, uh, but you're a memory champion, right? So that means you were in contests. How did those contests take place? Is it just like they show everybody kind of the same thing and you have to repeat it? Because you, know, you have been able to you know, recall the entire United States Congress. I know that uh, an entire play, a deck of playing cards, less than 90 seconds. They give you sequence numbers, the, you know, 100 plus digit sequence of numbers and you know you, you memorize it perfectly if you look at five minutes how does the contest go and how many contestants are there because it seems like yeah I, I think i know four or five different people when i was looking you up that had different things but it seems like there's a lot more memory experts than i thought yeah so i won the united states memory championship which has taken many different forms over the years and it's been held uh, most, most of the time it's been held in new york City, although last year it was held at MIT, MIT, uh, the university wanted to host it last year. So the last time it was at MIT. When I competed, there were qualifying events in the morning. So, and those events are more, um, not, they're not necessarily TV friendly. And then after that, uh, it was more TV friendly, more exciting uh, events to watch because it aired at that time on HDNet. It's also aired on the Science Channel. It's been on different channels over the years, but in the morning it is things that you write out. So um, you might memorize the longest sequence of numbers possible of five minutes. You have to get it perfectly, and a hundred digits is uh, probably wouldn't win. You would have to be over 120 digits or more perfectly in five minutes to do well. It's the fastest time to memorize a deck of playing cards. Five minutes is probably an average score for people competing in the U.S. Memory championship, you would definitely want to be under two minutes, under 90 seconds to have a chance to win that Amazing. event. Uh, it's memorizing hundreds of names in minutes, memorizing a 50-line poem in about 15 minutes. The qualifying events narrow the field down to about eight finalists. And then the finalists uh, will get onto a stage and um, they do things that are more interesting for a TV audience to watch. So it sort of becomes 
like spelling bee style, you know, the spelling bees air on ESPN uh, a lot. So they would have like the first person would have to give the first word from memory. Second person would give the second word from memory. If it gets to you and you can't recall the word or you give the wrong word, you're instantly eliminated from the competition. Just like in a spelling bee, if you spell it wrong, you're instantly eliminated from the competition. So, the, you know, it's a little uh, dramatic if you're if you're watching it on on TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, I since I guess you're programmed where every place you go, everything you do, because this is your life. You, you know, you remember everything, right? You just find ways. To, does this ever like backfire you? Because you know, for example, like if I'm fighting with my wife, and you know, she could sometimes say a lot of mean things to me. A lot of times, I deserve it. But she may say things that sometimes I really need to forget. You don't forget anything, right? So does it ever backfire on you? Is it ever could you ever turn it off and say, okay, maybe I don't want to pay attention to certain things? Well, definitely. I mean, it, it, it really is a skill that I. It's a skill that I can turn on or off. I really just consciously apply it when it's something that I know that is important to remember. Then I just implement one of these techniques, and I can lock it in within a few seconds or less. I can lock it into my memory there's probably a uh, a negative to being a memory champion in relationships and that is if i ever do happen <laughs> to forget anything you know they would say well, really mr memory <laughs> champion you forgot that <laughs> you forgot what i told you mr memory champion so i think i'm in even uh worse trouble than most guys would be in a relationship <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's awesome well Chester look I, I love that you, you you know thank you so much for coming on the podcast first of all but just going through those examples and showing people it, it does relate to every business and, I, and I'm hoping my audience understands that that just training yourself and understanding this is something that, that I did that that w w amazing I mean I, I was surprised and I just I'm so glad I got the chance to interview you but uh, if people want to learn more about you if they want to learn how to get better at this because you know we gave them a small sample size here and again you're everywhere all over the world I mean you, you have a remarkable uh, bio. If you look on Wikipedia, any place, I mean, where have you been, who you've spoken to, the institutions that hire you. But if people want to learn more about you and how to do this and train their memory, where could they go? How could they do it? Uh, definitely. So, you know, today was just the, really the tip of iceberg. There's so much more that people can learn. And again, I want to impress upon people that a little bit can go really a long way in your career. And all of this training can be actually fun. I hope people realize that as well just from this short interview. So ChesterSantos.com or InternationalManOfMemory.com. Both URLs will go to the same website. And also people can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Chester J. Santos. Again, Chester J. Santos. And I post one-minute tips each week from various interesting locations around the world because I am always traveling for my presentations to organizations around the world. You might see me at the Colosseum in Rome talking about how the Roman orders gave speeches hours in length from memory using something called the Roman Rome method. So every week on Instagram and Twitter, I'll post uh, an interesting tip related to memory from a famous location from somewhere in the world. So people can follow me on uh, social media to, to get those tips. Oh, that's awesome. And I was going to say, you know, I'm hoping to have you come back and join us again. I could make the date now. You're not going to forget it. That's for sure. I can make the. I'm going to finally forget <laughs> it. But, <laughs> but uh, thank, thank you so much for joining us. I, I think, uh, you know, you're going to get a, a lot of hits from my audience because this does make sense. I know we all have jobs. I talk to a lot of my audience, which is uh, I'm fortunate to have, uh, you know, a lot of people listen to this podcast. And I think they're going to be excited to learn a lot more from you. So thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Frank, for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, guys, hopefully that interview is okay. Again, I told you about the sound quality. We tried everything possible, and it was either that or nothing, and I thought that was better than nothing. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe you're like, oh, I had to listen to that. But uh, just the interview was fantastic. I got stumped a little bit because I think I was nervous to try to do everything. But uh, I still remember those words, those first, those words at, that, at the beginning. I mean, it's just amazing when you put a story behind it. Uh, for me, who, who goes out conferences, who meets a ton of people, I forget names a lot because I just meet so many people and I have a lot of people emailing me to come on the podcast and things like that. Uh, you know, that's something that's very beneficial to me, especially, in, in, you know, just research analysts and so much going on with the family and things like that. Just to, to really, you know, focus on remembering so many things and scheduling and stuff. Uh, it, it's, it's incredibly helpful for me. But again, this podcast is about you, not about me. I want to know what you thought. 
at frank at com. That's frank at com. And Chester's a great sport, great guy. And, uh, you know, we had fun with that interview even before and after. He was really, really cool. Now, I opened up with a personal story about my wife, telling you to keep her in the prayers. You know, she's got to get a biopsy and, you know, just hoping everything goes okay. But I've been engulfed uh, in the healthcare industry. It was always an industry that I was that I avoided, but I, I didn't want to really dig in because with my personality, uh, when I dig into an industry, I have to learn it and I have to know more about it than anyone in the entire world. That's just the way I am sometimes. And, you know, it's, it's cool and sometimes it's not cool because I'll spend weeks just reading hours and hours and hours and talking to millions of contacts. So that's what I did with the healthcare industry because I knew once I dug in, it's going to be pretty crazy. We all know that healthcare costs are spiraling out of control. We all know that healthcare, unless maybe if you have a city job, which provides really, really great benefits, uh, but the pay is usually very low, right? So, and a lot of those guys, as firemen, policemen, you know, put themselves in danger sometimes, uh, you know, teachers and things like that. But overall, I mean, even if you listen to this as a retiree, Medicaid, you're noticing the costs are going higher and higher and higher. I'm going to throw some numbers at you because I didn't know it was this bad and more important of how bad it's going to be. And you may say, well, we kind of know this. No, you didn't know this. I know you didn't know this because if these numbers were actually publicly available or just highlighted a lot more, and they are publicly available, but they're, they're just like buried in different things that I've you know, dug through tons and tons of research reports and just putting them together, it's pretty crazy and scary of how bad it's become. And I'm not building this up here, guys, because I've got to go over it with you right now. Because, I mean, numbers have been so bad that recently, this is September, Moody's came out, right? Credit agency, credit rating giant. They said that rising costs will cause U.S. spending on healthcare to rise from its already high levels, and this will result in a credit negative that will ripple across the economy, impact government, business, and consumers. So they actually came out in September and said that. Okay, so now the credit agencies are actually coming out and saying, okay, we're at the level where, whoa. Okay, it's getting very, very serious now. And the fact that we have no solution at all, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I have a solution. I don't. I want to highlight these numbers because as an investment point of view, you need to understand them. So when I look at the numbers, national health spending, between federal state spending, the private sector individuals, it used to be 5% of gross domestic product in 1960. It's close to 20% today, one fifth of our economy. Okay, these are the latest numbers available, but it gets even better. Because by 2025, it's going to go considerably higher and keep going higher and higher and higher. Now, what does this mean, right? We take a closer look at what it means for our families. There's something called the Millman Medical Index. Just know it's a standard in the industry. Right? They measure the cost of health care for a typical family that lives in America. And it's a typical family of four, which are covered by an employee-sponsored plan. And they go over the numbers. And you look every single year. It goes higher and higher and higher. But if you look at just 2014, it was $23,000. That's how much it costs for a family of four for health care. That includes everything, like out-of-pocket expenses, what you're paying for insurance, everything total. It's 2018, and that number has risen to over $28,000 in health care costs that the average family pays, 28000 So if we look at the amount of money the average family generates in America, and this called to the Federal Reserve, is $61,000 annually. The average family, right? So we have $61,000 that they're generating, and they're paying $20,000, over $28,000 to health care. Now, they're generating $61,000, right? That's before tax. Say we don't even use before tax, that we use the $61,000. Based on these numbers, the average family right now is spending an incredible 46% of his income on healthcare costs, 46%, and it continues to go higher and higher and higher. That number absolutely blew me away. I had no idea it was that high. Maybe it's me, I have no idea. Just, I mean, nearly 50% of the money that you make is going towards healthcare for the average family. I mean, even that is a crazy number, but the fact that it's gonna go much, much higher every single year, because there's no solutions on the table. There's a reason why Buffett, uh, Jamie Dimon, Jeff Bezos came out. They have millions of employees to try to fix this. I mean, you had Buffett come out and say it's 
It's very, very dangerous right now. I mean, it's, it's a hungry tapeworm on the American economy, but they understand it. it, it it's tough to have a solution. Even Bubba said it's not that I have a solution here, but we have to sit down and get people who are smart. Maybe there's a bunch of people that listen to this that are much, much smarter than me to understand this that comes up with solutions, but there has to be something on the table. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. You have to because the number's going to get even worse, okay? Because that percentage doesn't shock you. Maybe this will. Because according to the Congressional Budget Office, premiums for benchmark health care plans – they're expected to rise 15% this year. They're expected to rise 15% this year and then increase an average of 7% per year through 2028. How is that sustainable? So if you look at it, the continued rise of healthcare costs, not expected to slow anytime soon. If we compare the U.S. to other countries and say, well, it's a global problem. No, it's a U.S. problem because our numbers don't look any prettier. For example, U.S. healthcare spending rose to $4 trillion in 2018, right? It's about a 5% increase from last year. If that $4 trillion, right, the $4 trillion healthcare set, if that was a country, it would be ranked fifth as the largest economy in the world. Think about that. That's how crazy our healthcare system is. It's $4 trillion. You look at the GDP of every country, every single country, that will put it as the fifth largest economy in the world, just to put things in perspective. So to make matters worse, right, you say, well, all this spending, you know what? I think people believe if their tax dollars or whatever, you know, go, go a little off topic here. If your tax dollars go to really things that you could see improving roads, actually going to people who are trying to get jobs but can't and they have family, if you could really see it, you wouldn't mind, right? You'd be like, okay, I understand. You know, we are paying more, but these are going to really good things. You understand? This money, the increase in spending, it's not amounting to better health care for us. So a recent report from the Center of Disease Control and Prevention. They cited that for the first time in the 1960s, life expectancy in the U.S. declined for two straight years. That was 2016, 2017, the latest numbers. How is that possible? With all new medical advances, immunotherapy, gene therapy, keeping people alive, it's going down. How is that possible? That's supposed to be going up. All the amount of money that's going into this. New medicines to learn all these things. Rare disease, everything. How is that stat possible when you think about it? I couldn't believe that stat when I saw it. The life expectancy of the U.S. declined two straight years. First time since the 1960s. According to the Commonwealth Fund, that's basically a private foundation, you know, just dedicated to improving health care in the U.S. And, you know, it's a pretty big fund, which is really cool. They ranked the U.S. last among the top 11 industrialized countries in overall health care. So not only are we last, and that rating is last, this is performance and spending. So not only are we spending much, much more than everybody else, but it's resulting in worse health care for everyone. So when you look at these numbers, guys, I know it's a lot of numbers, but our health care system is clearly broken. We all know it. We have treatments becoming more expensive, drug prices are becoming more expensive, administration costs. I mean, the administration costs are just do a little research on administrative costs of the healthcare industry. It's incredible. It's so overblown. It's insane. It's, it's one of the biggest costs. Like we just have, you know, lots of people doing things. It doesn't make sense. You know, it's like they could take a, I think I read a stat. It was like they, they take a hundred patients in a hospital and they have like 400 people working there, which is insane to me. And you're looking at out of pocket costs continuing to rise. Healthcare companies charging more, right. To cover themselves. And what are they looking to do? What they're doing? They're choosing to cover fewer procedures, which, you know, they're not going to outline. But since healthcare and looking at, you know, in network, out of network, everything, it's almost it's like the tax code, right? It's almost impossible to understand. It doesn't make sense. It's it just, you know, it's just a million moving parts. And then when you try to get something very simple that you think, hey, you know, this person had cancer already. She needs a biopsy. This is very important for a doctor. And you're not going to cover it is pretty insane or the amount of cost that we have that we have to pay out of pocket to cover this is insane with the amount of money that we're actually paying for insurance. And you need insurance, right? Because that, that's the most, without healthcare insurance, it, it's the biggest reason for bankruptcies is healthcare. Because people do not have enough money to pay and maybe they get a rare disease and the amount of money. So you need it just in case, especially if you have kids, we all need it, we understand it. So you can't say, oh, forget it, let me do this. Let me have, you know, really, Minimal coverage, but when you have kids and things like that, it, it's pretty crazy. You know, you, you, something, God forbid, happens, it's, you know, it can cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, which most people don't have. But when we look at healthcare companies, they're not the only ones to blame. 
right? Companies that are raising costs continuously. I told you about my wife having to wait a month to get a biopsy. And the reason is because there's a massive shortage of doctors right now. So this is a shortage of 90,000 doctors. That's what's going to be by 2025, right? And this is mostly due to preference because young adults, they can't really afford the high cost of medical school along with lengthy residencies. But also more doctors are choosing to leave the field. And I went in and looked at so many of these studies and a lot of it includes with, you know, interconnected computer programs. I had my doctor who actually left because of this. He's like these computer programs. I put them in. There's no information there. It goes back. Yeah, so a lot of them are having trouble where we just threw electronic healthcare systems in and almost like you're buying, you know, a new iPhone for the first time or, you know, the BlackBerry phone and there's a million things that don't work and they have to send updates to get it work and everything needs to change, uh, you know, or a new app or something. That, that's what happened with healthcare. And a lot of these guys were like just everything's interconnected. A lot of the records were there. They're not there. And they said it was just too difficult. And then they, a lot of them got frustrated and said, if I have to do this, I don't even want to be in this profession. And others simply said that they lost a the drive. I mean, they wanted to help the world. They care about their patients. And they said that the bottom line has come, become too important to these hospitals, where it's a joke. And they said, I'd rather do something else. And I left the pro profession. I mean, how crazy is that when you think about it? I mean, people do not want to become doctors. I mean, they're choosing technology, STEM, all that stuff, science. But there's a massive shortage of doctors out there. When you look at baby boomers, it's another major factor, right? America's aging at an incredible rate. We've heard about this for how many years, but it's getting much, much worse in terms of how many older people are starting to retire. I mean, millions and millions and millions. So if you look at the over 65 population and over 65, you know, those are people who require the most health care. We're looking at huge, huge growth. I mean, it's going to surge by more than 25 million people over the next 20 years, from 2020 to 2040. I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you. So you're looking at this and you say, well, from 2000 to 2016, 16 years, it went from 35 million to 49 million of baby boomers that you know, hit retirement age over 65. But it accelerates tremendously from there to you know, 2020, six, 2016 to 2020, you're looking at over 7 million people that are now over 65, just from that four year period. And if we take 2020 to 2040, it goes from 60, 56 million to 82 million. I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you. Just know that it's gonna get much, much worse. There's gonna be more people retiring and they're gonna require more healthcare, which means more money, higher costs to everybody else in the industry. So there's no end in sight. These trends are accelerating on a percentage basis. Usually when you have growth trends on a percentage basis, they kind of slow over time, right? I mean, it's easy to grow a company from 1 million sales to 10 million sales, but in 10 million to maybe 20 million. But when you have 100 million in sales, it's hard to get to 200 million. If you go to 100 million to 130 million, it's amazing growth, but it's only 30% compared to 200% that you were growing. The percentages are going higher on these trends, which is incredible. And one of the biggest reasons we have healthcare costs spiraling out of control is really because of us. I mean, half the population has... One or more chronic conditions, if it's asthma, if it's uh, health disease, diabetes. So we have two-thirds of all adults in the U.S. are either overweight or obese. And CDC says this accounts for about $147 billion in healthcare costs when you're factoring everything, like treatments, diagnosis, medical preventions, and things like that. Looking at the numbers and bringing this together, guys, we have a major, major problem on our hands. And more than, I think... 95% of the people out there believe. And you're not seeing these numbers published a lot. I see them in stories here or there, but putting it all together. I mean, you're looking at rising healthcare spending. It's now outpacing, think about this, discretionary spending, education, infrastructure, in terms of widening the U.S. deficit. It's now more. It accounts for more. I mean, healthcare expenses for households are at critical levels, accounting for nearly 50% of household income. What does that mean? It leaves fewer discretionary dollars for families to spend on whatever. I'm gonna buy a new car, a house, fix up your house, whatever you want, even if they want you know, education. You wonder why you know, student loans, it keeps going higher and higher and higher. How do families have money to pay for these college where tuition costs continue to rise and go through the roof? I know about the debt situation, guys. People have been complaining about the 1970s, the 60s. This is much more than that. 
because you're looking at a component that there is no solution for. You can say, well, the government will print and bail out money. You know, we have a political system right now where nothing's going to get passed because these two guys, these two parties hate each other. Nothing. It doesn't matter if it's good for you, if it's good for the country. No. If one says red, the other says blue. One says yes, the other says no. It doesn't matter. Just look at the results of anything that's voted. Like, come on. If you're, if you're a Democrat right now, even if you hate Trump, there's some things that you can say, well, the economy is doing better. This, you know, if you're a Republican and you, you, you hate Democrats, I mean, there's certain parts of their policy, whether it's, hey, at least we have affordable health care for everybody. What, what, there's certain things that you're going to say, OK, you know what? This makes sense because it's better for the people. No, they don't care. If it's a Republican idea, every Democrat votes no and vice versa. That's our country right now. And that's not going to change. So the fact that it's 50 percent of cost for people is really, really scary. Now, who's the biggest beneficiary of these? Health insurance companies. These guys are making an absolute fortune because they're trying to raise costs. They pass things called a certain tax that got suspended for 2017, 2018, where these companies have to pay billions of dollars in this special tax. So it's called a special fee, right? HIF fee. And it got suspended in 2017 and 2019. And it's supposed to come back in 2020. But and this fee cost, I think when they first launched it around 2014, I believe, it was $8 billion, and then it rose in 2018 to $14 billion. I think it's the eight largest healthcare insurers had to pay, and they're not allowed to write any of this off. It comes directly from their bottom line. But now it got suspended in 2019, which was used as a little bit of a stipulation for, I think it was a couple of Republicans to vote for you know, the government not to get shut down in 2016. And it's one of the things and say, yeah, OK, we'll suspend it for 2019, which saved these companies billions of dollars. But 2020 is an election year. Unless you want to commit political suicide, there's no way you're going to reinstate that fee. Because if you do, what's going to happen? Health insurance companies are going to raise their premiums on seniors and everybody else. And with seniors, when it comes to voters, I don't need to tell you, those are the biggest voters. Those are the people that go out and they're going to vote. So there's no way the politicians are going to vote to say, hey, you know what? Let's reinstate this 2020. No, it's going to be pushed out to 2021, 2022, which means billions of dollars of profits are going to flow into these health insurance companies. And when you look at I broke down the insurance companies and guys, you're getting my issue today because your research advisor where I'm covering everything I'm saying right now, including my best pick for this sector and go more in de details of numbers. Guys, it's a newsletter that we lose money on because our goal is to get people who don't know us that well into that newsletter to see my research this way. Hey, they're going to subscribe to more services and we charge anywhere from you know, pretty much under $50 for that newsletter for the year, which is a bargain. Okay. I mean, this issue alone, I could probably sell for thousands of dollars if I wanted to, if you, if you read it. And you guys could, frankcurzyresearch.com, if you read it and you think otherwise, let me know, but I know you won't. But there's a lot of research. There's a lot of stuff in there. It's original. You're not going to hear from any place else. But when you're looking at the health insurers, this fee accounts for anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of profits, and that's taken out of their earnings. Now that this is going to get suspended, that number goes back into earnings, and the analysts right now have not really updated their numbers. So you're looking at stocks trading at 16 times earnings that are really trading at 13 times earnings, and people don't know that. But even more specifically, there's several of these that are very, very good buys because of the specific dynamics. You're seeing a lot of M&A in this space. CVS, Aetna, you know, tons, it's eight major. So you look at eight majors and now you don't really need eight majors. So you're going to see a lot of consolidation probably, which means if you buy some of the, the lower price ones, you have a good shot that they're going to consolidate into some of the big ones like United Healthcare. But this is an industry that's going to make tons and tons of profits going forward. This, when I say this, I say the shit's, the shit's not going to hit the fan for a while, but it's something we need to tackle right now, this problem. Like it needs to be tackled right now. We need smart people lock themselves in a room and say, okay, here's how we solve this problem. Here's how we reduce costs because in another three, four, five years from now, I mean, what is it going to do? 70% of, of income? I just gave you the numbers. 15% premium is going to get raised this year, 7% annually going forward. What does that mean? What do you get? 60, 70% of, of the average family income is going to go to healthcare, out of pocket costs? It's not sustainable. That's going to happen over the next three to five years if we don't have a solution. Can we have a solution? Yeah, we will, because if we don't, the market's going to crash and we're going to print money and, and, and finally you know, pay more attention to this, hopefully. But it needs to be done right now. In the meantime, health insurers, 
even medical device makers. I mean, you have 40, 30, 40 million Americans now being covered with uh, Obamacare. So, you know, that's 40 million more people that are going to buy more devices, more prescription drugs, more everything. And we've seen this industry really take off, but there's another level. These stocks are dirt cheap right now. Some of them are pulled back because of this fee. And there's no way that this thing, that the politicians are going to vote to reinstate this fee unless they don't want a job because it's going to be directly responsible. I listened to the conference calls on, on almost every one of the major health care insurers, and all of them said the same thing. They don't think this fee is going to be extended. It's going to be pretty crazy heading into election year. So you can almost pick any one of them, and you'd probably do well on them. You can figure out the eight by yourself. But the one that I have, I think, is going to go up over 100% in the next three years because they have a huge major advantage. Again, not giving the stock away, not giving anything else away because people pay for my research. But that newsletter, Cursor Research Advisory, guys, we charge a low price to get as many people in. It's my way of giving back. Again, it's not something that's a money maker. Uh, it does generate money for us because a lot of people that come into that newsletter usually buy our higher price products and really get our research for Curzio Venture Opportunities, my Galkins backend newsletter, where it's really specialized stuff that you're not going to you know, see in too many other places and, and you know, a lot of original ideas. But if you're interested in that, just go to our website, CurzioResearch.com, and you can subscribe, uh, free trial, whatever you need. But uh, it's a really good issue. I spent a lot of time on it, guys, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. So once again, we're hiring now in the market for a marketing director. You're going to have a very competitive salary, which includes a percentage of sales you generate as well as a possible equity stake. Remember, guys, with our token offering, it's a go. Those tokens represent equity. That gives us a significant advantage to offer our employees equity, almost like options in our company, right? Which means you participate in our growth, which is the way it's supposed to be if you're a director of a company. You wanna participate in the growth, right? That's the way it should be. That's the way it should be across the board. But a lot of times it's not. We're also looking to hire junior analysts, experienced writers, since we have tons of great content, podcasts, interviews, we wanna to turn to articles and you know, not only send them out to, to generate new subscribers, get our brand in front of more people, but also to publish our content on our educational platform, which we plan to launch later this year. And I talked about that a lot as we were raising this money. And I'm talking about a real educational platform, not a BS one, that actually teaches fundamental investing. Well, you don't really find that too many places. Yeah, technical trading charts and all that. Yeah, you can get a million of those. But not really fundamental. And make it interesting. And putting everything our analysts learn during their careers, their mistakes, everything. Publishing short videos. Help you become better investors. I know the guys I interview would love to do that for me. You know, I'm giving a lot of exposure to this podcast because of you. The audience grows. These guys will help me out. They say, hey, you know what? Could you tape a short video about this that we just talked about? Could you th I'll throw it up on the site. I even put the name of that company underneath it. But that's the educational platform I want to create for everyone. And that's why we're looking to hire new writers, also new analysts, and build Curzio Research. So, guys, thanks so much for listening. Really, really appreciate all your support. I'll see you guys in seven days. Take care. The information presented on Wall Street Unplugged is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decisions solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility. Wall Street Unplugged, produced by the Choose Yourself Podcast Network, the leader in podcasts produced to help you choose yourself.